Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'm going to start by telling a story that I tell in the introduction of the book, which explains basically how I started reporting this. My family and I have been vacationing in the same town for a long time, and it's a working class town. And one year we went there, and it seemed to me like there were no men there anymore. Um, there were no men going down the streets in their construction trucks. There were no men at church. And I just became curious, like what had happened to all the men? This was at the height of the recession. So I went into the supermarket, and I kind of sidled up to a woman whose name I learned later was Bethany. And so I started talking to her like, so, you know, you have, uh, you have a kid with you. Where's the, uh, where's the dad, Bethany? And, uh, and she, said, uh, she said, you know, she's not married to the dad. Um, do you want to get married? Yeah, I'd love to get married, but not to that guy. Uh, why? And then here's where it got pretty insulting. It's a phrase that I've heard many times, actually, in the reporting of this book, some version of this. Uh, because he'd be just another mouth to feed, is basically what she said. And so I became kind of involved in their lives. Of course, I wanted to know who this guy was. His name was Calvin. I started to call him. He and I developed a relationship, which was slightly dysfunctional, because Calvin was a slightly dysfunctional guy. So he would call me from the 7-Eleven and be like, I really don't know how to work the, that's like Tesco, you know, I don't know how to work the machine here, you know, and I'd walk him through it. And, you know, I was basically trying to fix his life, is what happened, and get him a job and get him back with the mother of his children, and this is when the light bulb went off for me, that Calvin was never gonna take the seat at the table in his old house. This was never gonna happen, because essentially the dynamics between Calvin and Bethany had changed so much that she was playing that role. She was supporting the family, she was the one going to school, she was working, she was bringing up the kid, so the idea that he would just waltz back in one day was really not gonna happen. Um, and that was 2009 when women became more than 50% of the workforce, and really that in of itself is a monumental historical development. Even in my lifetime, the working woman was such a cool, interesting development that I remember like, woman in a pantsuit, let's make a sitcom about a woman in a pantsuit. That was like an exciting development. So, although this is, looks like a Sex Pistols cover and it's very sort of triumphant, uh, it's actually not triumphalist. Like what's happening to Calvin is described by many economists to me as the greatest social crisis we're facing. Um, that it's, it's actually not good for all these men to be out of work. And the second reason we should care about Calvin is because men like Calvin have long defined our poles of masculinity for all of us. And so we have this sense that, you know, there is a man and the man behaves like this and we have a sort of mythology of the working class man here might come out as kind of overly tough politicians. In the US, if you watch the American conventions, we, we have a mythology of the manufacturing class. I, even as the manufacturing class plays a much smaller role in American politics, we talk about it now all the time. And I think the reason both American parties talk about it is because it's a proxy for talking about what's happened to manhood and where is masculinity. Women are entering professions at all levels. So it's not merely that you have working class women supporting their families. You have basically got a flood of women into professional schools these days. Here, it's medicine. Uh, we've got about 52% of women in medical school, law school. Um, women earn more PhDs than men, sort of at the education level, you really see a flip happening. Um, I think about it, uh, and some feminists like this, and some feminists think this is obnoxious, uh, a traveling sisterhood in the economy. And what I mean by that is that women like me uh, are working more and more, and that opens up jobs at the bottom of the workforce for things that wives used to do, you know, things that women used to do for free, watch the children, elder care, food preparation, you know, so it becomes this sort of loop whereby women at the top enter and then women at the bottom do other jobs. Um, this disparity between men and women is especially true for young people. So uh, we're not just talking about the Calvins of the world here. What we have is a kind of new generation of people growing up where the women are starting out life better qualified than the men. So they start out with better credentials and in the US they start out earning more money. So that's the big change because if you think 
think about it, that's the age at which people are sort of sizing each other up, making decisions about their future life, deciding whether to get married. It's before they have children, before women have even you know, thought about the term glass ceiling that much. And so that in and of itself is a significant change among the college educated. Now here's the term I come up with in this book, also insulting, to describe kind of the large scale changes that I've noticed uh, over the course of the century, basically. And that is plastic woman and cardboard man. By that, I mean that women have, over the course of the century, vastly changed the way that they behave in the public sphere. So it used to be that women didn't work at all, and then they didn't work when they got married, and then they didn't work when they had children. Um, and over time, women have sort of changed and gone through that. This, the other thing that happens is that women take over professions that are dominated by men, like pharmacy and certain categories of medicine. Men never do the opposite. This shows up on personality tests too. Sort of women continually define themselves using an increasing number of adjectives over the course of the last 50 years that we used to consider male, like dominant, aggressive, competitive. Men do not do that. They, in fact, back off into a corner. They run away from professions that women enter, and they run away from the descriptors that they think of as overly feminine. In the two years since I've been reporting and reported this book, the vast change for me is that I started to think about how it affected the way we live now, the specifics of people's relationships, young people, how they have sex, how they make decisions about who they're going to marry, how they make decisions about how to raise their children. So it became a much more personal and intimate book, so that chapter by chapter you're essentially following you know, couples, people, and see, who are living at this edge where the woman is doing one thing and the man is doing another thing and seeing how that impacts their lives. Um, so I won't get deeply into this, but I write about what we in the U.S. call the hookup culture. There's a sort of single way that the culture views this, which is that we have this libertine culture, uh, which is highly pornified and, and is created by men for men. And one of my theories is that we view that completely wrong, that in fact, women need this culture at this moment in their lives in order to sort of fulfill their ambition. Uh, that's kind of a terrible, bad summary, but we'll talk about it more. I don't want to get too deeply into it right now. Um, the second thing I write about is models of marriage, um, which have changed tremendously because of the trends that I describe. Uh, marriage is um, going in two completely opposite class-determined directions these days. So for the educated classes, uh, I define something called the seesaw marriage. And the seesaw marriage is basically this idea that women and men take turns uh, doing playing the breadwinner role, sort of stepping up and stepping back. So the Obamas have a typical seesaw marriage where Michelle Obama was making a lot of money as a healthcare executive when Barack Obama was working in public service and going to law school, and then they switch places, he becomes the president, she plays a supportive role. Basically, no one is trapped in those 1962 feminine mystique slash revolutionary road, I have to be the breadwinner, it's like a noose around my neck, or for the women, I have to be trapped at home making the beds. So we've loosened up the gender roles among the college educated classes, and that's created the most stable, happy marriages we've had in many decades. Um, for everybody else, the exact opposite is happening. Far fewer people getting married, lots more children born to single mothers. That's happening both here and in the U.S. And so, um, uh, so, that's, you know, so that's one of the sort of intimate consequences of the trends that I describe. It's mostly about uh, relaxing roles. If I think about what I want out of this book for my own son, um, I want for him to have a life when he grows up that he can go to the playground in the middle of the day on a Friday, uh, come home from work, work four days a week, and no person passing by that playground looks at him and says, what is wrong with that guy? He must not have a job because he's here at the playground at 3 p.m. So that is the positive outcome. Think of it as like, you know, the man is dead, long live the man. That's the nicer version of the title. So thank you very much, and now we will talk. You mentioned briefly, and it is one of the most interesting, but also I think one of the most controversial chapters of the book. It's the first chapter, yes, which is called Hearts of Steel, about so-called hookup culture. Yes. There's this idea of sort of raunch and the idea that these women, to some extent, are appropriating quite pornified uh, ways of behaving and vocabulary and so on. And the obvious kind of old school reading of that is that's not empowering at all. All they're doing is is digesting pre-cooked misogyny and spewing it back out again. Mm -hmm. It's part of the, what many people see as the busted flush of 
post-feminism. Far be it for a man to suggest such things. Um, but I, you don't see it that way, no, do No, I you? don't see it that way. So the general view of this, as I said before, is that women are the victims entirely in the hookup culture. There's been many books in America written about this. And so there were these wonderful uh, researchers, God bless them, I never could have done it myself, who camped out in a college dorm for four years, four years, like a Drew Barrymore movie, four years they camped out. And they came in looking for patterns of sexual violence. Instead, what they found was the opposite, something very surprising, that while on a day-to-day -day basis, the women had lots of complaints, oh, these guys don't commit, these guys are jerks, etc., etc. In fact, what they noticed over the four-year period was that the women were avoiding getting into long-term relationships, that that was not something they wanted at that point point in their lives. They did not want one night stands, but they certainly did not want to get tied down. That basically, if in the 19th century, the worst thing that could happen to you is that you would get pregnant accidentally, now the worst thing that can happen to you is that you get sort of, you know, chased by an overly eager suitor who's desperate to marry you when you're 21 years old and tell you where you should live and what you should do. That's considered sort of dangerous, low-class behavior. Since I wrote this story and the chapter, I've had lots of letters from young women. This is the part of the book that young women like, and I wish I had one of them with me, but they are explaining to me exactly what this third kind of relationship they're trying to form sounds like. It's not a one-night stand, it's not a path to marriage, but actually when I read these letters, I do not shudder for the future of my children. The, these relationships seem fine and But in your account, I mean, there's one woman who kind of impersonates a Thai prostitute at one point in the evening's yes. proceedings, right? Yes. And they're passing around on their cell phones porno images and all this stuff, right? right? And maybe if they're at college, that kind of insulates them from the worst aspects of this. But there's a book, uh, a British book called Living Dolls by Natasha Walter. Have you read that? Mm -hmm. I have. Which actually. is the exact opposite reading right. of all this, which sa says that women trying to kind of embrace this pornified culture just lays them even lower. Yeah, we've right. had a book like that called Wild. I can't remember. It was by Aria Levy, a great writer. So here's what I think. About. I purposely chose girls who were, I thought, the crudest possible. I mean, I felt like, you know, do you guys know who Ruth Westheimer is? I mean, I, be, I, I basically felt odd as like a sort of 42-year-old woman walking among these, you know, spike heel business schools. And it was clear that they, what they were doing in that context, because they're in a very male context, a very rough business school context, was trying to to keep up with the boys. And it was also clear that they were playing a kind of theater, right? And I thought that I was picking, in other words, this wasn't natural to them. They were trying to show that if they could keep up and be totally unfazed with what the guys were doing, that would mean that they wouldn't be intimidated when they were in the boardroom. When Girls, the HBO show Girls comes, you'll see that this is not just me making this up, but that this trend is actually quite, you know, widespread and out there. There's also a new movie called Bachelorette, a great indie movie. Clearly, this is a moment of kind of weird, empowered girl raunch. The book seems to imply that eventually there'll be such pressure from below by dint of all these women becoming educated and, and plastic, so to speak, and, and moving into law and medicine and so on that in the end, that power structure will have to give way to a mm -hmm. large extent. Is that a correct well, reading? Well, it seems absurdly lopsided, right? Like you go to firms and places and it seems like you have this huge sort of middle and middle upper management, which is female, and then you have men at the very top, right? And that's true that the richest people in the world are men. Like if you take the super uber rich, uh, which, who have a lot of power, they are largely men, so that's true. It can be simultaneously true that there's a huge amount of social dislocation and that you can roam around and feel like the world is turned upside down and the very top still be like that, right? So it's not as if like the fact that it's you know, not true up there means it's not, not true everywhere else, right? right? So that's the first thing I think is really important to acknowledge because it, it, always, it, it always pains me that sort of I go to events and all anyone wants to talk about is the number of CEOs. That's like this, this much of society, right? But it's an important sector of society because they have a lot of the power. Talking in optimistic terms about all this, mm -hmm. about the final and belated shattering of the glass ceiling, mm -hmm. depends to some extent on the idea that in the end, power will be synonymous with merit, right? But anyone who knows anything about class, for example, mm -hmm. right? I would argue you only have to look at the current government, right? Mm -hmm. To know that that doesn't always hold true. Right. In which case you might have the worst of all possible outcomes. And I think we're kind of there now. Which is what? Which is these crap, slovenly, men-behaving-badly fellas 
become the prime minister. Yeah, are still sitting there. <laughs> Patriarchy's here still, right? Uh -huh. But whereas 50 years ago, I would have, I'd like to have thought that I could look at Roosevelt or Churchill and those people and kind of understand why they were there. Like they right? were men of character. Yeah. And now I look and there's these fellas who say, bring it on and their trousers are slightly too tight and they pretend to like soccer. And it isn't really working anymore, but that doesn't mean they're going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So all these hugely educated, empowered women could end up bashing their head against a glass ceiling, which is just got, which is even more frustrating than it was, say, 30 or 40 years mm -hmm. ago. Because they're so close. And because we have power structures via, in this country, public schools and the way that parliament works and all that, which, which kind of ensure that no matter how crap you are, if you're a certain sort of man, you'll get the job. That's terrible. <laughs> well, you know, I would argue Mitt Romney is a good... I mean, there must have been a Republican woman who was better than him, right? Sarah Palin. <laughs> yeah. You got me. Yeah. No, that's... I hadn't thought of that. That's a fabulous theory. I mean, because in, in the U.S., I mean, this, this doesn't make so much sense in this context, but people are always saying to me, you know, with the college education gap is always at the bottom, and when you get to the very top, you know, you see that sort of for rich men and rich women from college-educated families, there is no gap. They go to university at the same rates, which, which is such a bad argument. The only reason they go to university at the same rates is because Mitt Romney's sons get to go to the same university he went to, not because they're qualified, exactly, because exactly. there's affirmative action for men in private colleges, right. which public schools are not allowed to get away with. So it's not because they're equivalent, it's because private schools can do whatever they want to. So, um, so, so it is perfectly possible to be that lazy guy, sort of graduate from elite schools and then become the president. Can you genuinely imagine a world in which half of the nurses, say, mm -hmm. are men, right? And half of the preschool teachers are men. And half of the, of the men that you talked about who are waiting to pick up their kids are three o'clock, speaking of someone who did that today, mm -hmm. are men and no one's looking at them a bit funny? Like, what are you doing here? Are you on, the, are you you on know, benefits? You know? I don't know about half. Like, I, there's, so, so I can definitely imagine a world where more women would like to behave the way, I don't know if you guys know who Marissa Mayer is. She was an executive at Google who got chosen to be the CEO of Yahoo when she was pregnant and she told, every, and she told everyone she was not taking any maternity leave. There certainly is more people who would like to behave like that, who are these uber super women who would like to just work and work and work and be the CEOs and but it's socially unacceptable right and there certainly are slightly larger percentage let's let's start with 25 percent of yeah. men who would like to work less in the last year we finally had the first inklings of shows in which the men were not only competent at home but remained sexy to their wives which is important because it means that they're not emasculated i don't know if you've had that here but we've had like four of them like what can you give me some titles yeah like, like okay up all night is one right. uh, with will arnett where he plays a stay-at-home dad and his wife still loves him what to expect when you're expecting has chris rock running this dude's group and they hang out all day and you know whatever there's you know and there's another one called guys with kids in which they sit at home and be okay. cool and modern family and on mm. and on yeah. Men behaving nicely. Men behaving nicely, taking care of their children, <laughs> not knocking down all the stuff on the table, and still being sexy. Okay. That's important. 